Um, all right. Okay, I think we are, I think we might be live. Right, so welcome back everyone to the FPL script. Apologies for our absence. It might have been a three game week long absence, um, but we are back finally with episode 33 and our game week 34 uh, preview. But before we quickly touch on to that, I'm Fran, uh, your co-host, otherwise known as FPL Fran on Twitter, uh, with my co-host JD, otherwise known as Schadenfreudus with a one on Twitter. Um, this week... Sorry. Oh right, sorry, of course. I've um I've totally forgotten to stream. So um for the people who are listening on audio podcasts, you'll you'll not know what happened, but effectively we just started um with the captaincy, which is um for anyone who's a regular of the show where we end. <laughs> but um all right, so game week thirty three review. Um I finally had a good week in FPL. It's been a pretty long time coming, and I think generally of course Yes, the way the fixtures fell, it was pretty hard to navigate considering the wildcard strategy I had. But I think also just in terms of outcome, you know, variance wise, I still haven't really recovered from the negative variance that I've suffered um, starting from my wildcard. So it's been a pretty topsy turvy run, but this was finally a good week. We had Flecken, we had Guardiol, so we could enjoy those things. But other than that, it was actually a pretty dull week um, for most of, of us managers. You know, Liverpool Arsenal being super tame. It was the reverse of previous week for me because I actually benched some Arsenal players, you know, taking the chance, uh, Brighton away, expecting Saka with less minutes, but then I got destroyed uh, for doing it and taking that sort of free risk per se. Um, this week, of course, I chose not to do so because I didn't have the free risk um, and it just turned out really poorly for me. What about you, JD? Yeah, hi everyone. So, uh, as Fran already has apologized, I will do the same. Uh, it's good to be back though, after a long time. Hope I can remember how to uh, get the words out. So, my week was bad and I've not had a good week in such a long time. It's just a numbing sensation at this point. Uh, my last three transfers in the last three game weeks have been Holland in against Aston Villa, didn't play. Uh, Gusto against Sheffield United, didn't play. And now, I bought Foden this week for Saka, who didn't play. So, great to have x mins EV. Not great to have uh, nothing to show for in real mins. And it's just, I, I, I just laughed and moved on, honestly. But also, I mean, I am a human being, so it does start to hurt somewhere at some time because uh, it's hard to not take it personally. And... Mm. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. Uh, the only two positives this week were Regulon, who yeah. uh, and even in that I can I'm, I managed to find uh, some injustice, which was that he lost a bonus point after the full time, like after a while, as after after I think an hour of full time. Oh, so yeah. that that's uh, symptomatic of my uh, recent game weeks. And the other one was Gusto six pointer, uh, and uh, Fran, you benched him, right? Yeah, I'm I benched not... him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you had better defenders to play. I unfortunately didn't. And the two auto subs I had was Neto and Yudogi, who scored zero <laughs> points between them. So a lot of jammy auto sub uh, yeah, for me. Yeah. No Garnacho. Wow. Yeah. Even even this week, even in 45 minutes, Garnacho has scored more auto sub points for the, his owners than I've had in the last three weeks. That's actually that's I can't fathom. I can't actually fathom that. But anyway, uh, e enough of the cry fist uh, we can move on <laughs> yeah absolutely so um you know going back to our usual segment the x-men's corner i think a lot of people are you know heading towards say wild card 35 trajectory or ultimately you know thinking about picks on a free hit or maybe you're like me and you're trying to decide whether you want to get in on the action of gaming 34 or you maybe take a bit more of a passive approach i'll talk about that a little bit later because i think uh, I might be one of the few uh, managers who are sort of walking on that path without many chips left. Bench boost remaining for me. Um, but yeah, let's just touch on the double gaming teams. I think Wolves is probably a team that I, I haven't seen really featured at all within you know many free hits, to be honest. Part of that is because um, seemingly some of the other teams have better fixtures. And one of the fixtures, unfortunately, for Wolves is Arsenal. But they do have two home, home games um, You know, at the end of the day. I mean, what do you think about their assets? So I think the assets we are primarily concerned with are Sarabia and Wangi Chan, 
in midfield mm-hmm. uh, kuna among the forwards and eight nori in defense yeah because i don't see any issues with anyone else six men so for example if you were to go for kilman or jose sa it's perfectly fine they will play 180 minutes and uh, you should not be worried about those so firstly i think uh, more than x means i think it's expense for wolves because who is going to take the penalties now yeah. that all three of them are fit and i suspect that review has sort of divided the penalty share between all three of them uh, also because if you look at their let's say the distribution of their minutes you might end up in scenarios where only two of them or the rare scenario where only one of them is left on the pitch so considering all of those things i don't know I, I, my initial feeling is that kuna might be the one who is on penalties but i i have honestly i could not tell you for sure uh, do you have any strong opinions on on penalties i think sarabia should be on pens and i think huang might take over kunya as well but i i think huang will have reduced minutes still this week given that he's coming I back agree. from injury um yeah, and yeah. we know that Sarabia took a pen versus United right so um the question i suppose is whether he's also going to have reduced minutes because a couple of, of players are now back in the squad um mm. and he he however has been playing well though and i think if i had to pick a pick i think i'd still go Sarabia because um the midfield position does seem to be a little bit dwindling right now on the free hit you know people are going Ben Brereton Diaz deep and part of that is also because people are getting a little bit turned off by um some of the midfielders from Liverpool and Arsenal which means that you you freed up another spot and of course depending on on you know where you're seeing Olise's minutes are um mm. and and also whether he has pen share I, i think a lot of people might still lean towards Sarabia as a pick and he's a very fair pick um but yeah i think going back to Wolves in general you know you're probably only really looking at Sarabia as a serious pick Cunha I think is is nicer for the type of manager who's planning to you know make transfers for the rest of the season because at least you've got Luton at home and you know that his minutes yeah. will sort of you know go upwards right as opposed to what 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 recently has been sort of a slow steady tick up of minutes for for Cunha but if you if you think he's not on penalties you know and he has an Arsenal fixture it's not exactly the best double so that's why I think it's it's hard to fit in a Wolves player Uh, within your draft and and Saz pretty close as a keeper option but he also feels worse than um you know potentially a, a Jordan Pickford still depending on how you you evaluate let's say the Everton defense for this week yeah and i think if you look at the clean sheet odds uh, wolves definitely are not anywhere no, close to the top close. and the other thing to consider is that depending only on saves or the odd assist because Jose Sa has a lot of a fantasy legacy when it comes to assists <laughs> yeah. but we certainly can't depend on that and mm-hmm. the, uh, the fact that no one wants to go for triple everton in attack or uh, there could potentially be a spot for dean anderson even though i think munoz is so much better and can can uh, give you so much more in terms of attacking output yeah the, the other the overall structure of your team might demand going for someone like dean anderson and that mm. is a sensible approach i think so uh, we are a little bit uh, we disagree a little bit on maybe sarabia uh, in terms of penalties but what i don't disagree with is that i don't see his minutes dwindling or or going down even yeah. a little bit so i don't think there's an issue with that uh, and also i think maybe eight nori can go back to being left back because if all the attackers are fit that could also potentially happen right if he's fit that is i, I still don't know if he's going to be uh, back in the team for sure because last week's update was vague right as far as i understand yeah and and he wasn't in the squad either but i think you know exactly. we yeah. we saw that he was in training i i think yeah. you make a good point yeah if you if you don't see him as part of the front of three and he has an arsenal fixture it's hard to go for it and it, it's like the you know the boat has sort of sailed with him um but it it also depends right like let's say if huang is still you know needing a sub there might be minutes where he plays 20 30 minutes um in attacking that positions and and that could be helpful yeah. for him Um I agree with you on Sarabi I just think that he has been not an early sub but he's you know subbed around 82 minutes so I think obviously people who are you know updating his minutes on review I believe his I believe his defaults are around 70ish minutes but once you raise that up I think also just you know be cognizant that you shouldn't raise it too far up um I wouldn't say he's like a 90 minute player uh, Would you go something like let's say start off with 81 and go let's say 81 78 
75 and then plateau around 72 73 so i i'm kind of treating him like a an 80 82 minute decay player but then okay i think um petroneto is back right so that has some small impacts on his minutes for sure but i don't think petroneto will come back too soon and we don't yeah, exactly. have too final, many fixtures left yeah, you're, you're yeah. gonna final sell sarabi games, after 35 anyways or rather his yeah. his his like use case in your fpl team is it's gone after gaming 35 right so there's no point okay, even okay. thinking about his minutes after that in my opinion so um, yeah, yeah I, I've just yeah. Um, decayed at 83, and, and just knowing that, you know, even if I had him on my team in review, I'd, I mean, he'd be a transfer out immediately, but yeah. Makes sense. Uh, we can move on to the next team, which is Crystal Palace, and we've already sort of foreshadowed the options that we have from Crystal Palace, and mm -hmm. just to list them out, uh, Dean Henderson and Bonios in defense. Uh, Joachim Anderson would have been a good option in other seasons, but I yeah. definitely think that Munoz has the attacking upside. So yeah, I'll say I'm Mitchell probably is better than Anderson as well. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the midfield is obviously Eze and Olise, mm -hmm. and Muteta as, as your forward. So we are looking at x means for these players. Now, first, I want to know your position on, let's say, Edward, or the risk of Watson Edward taking minutes off of Mateta. What do you think? I think it's pretty pretty slim in terms of you know thinking about like a start or like a very early substitution. So I I I see Mateta more around like your low eighties, almost as a minimum because yeah, recently his minutes have been good. Edouard has been back for a while, but I think some people will also mention too that before he was injured, he was also barely getting a sniff in the side. Um, mm. And also Mateta has just played well recently, so. I'm struggling to believe that Mateta will sort of lose minutes. It might be the case, of course. I mean, for example, the Man City game is a good example where, you know, if let's say Palace are, you know, they, they kind of see a game as a foregone conclusion. Like, you'll see these early substitutions come out. But, you know, in reality, the opponents that they have, I'm not expecting Palace to get blown apart, really. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really expecting, you know, between 80 to 90 for Mateta. But obviously, I, I'd say, you know, error on the side of caution for on him. But I wouldn't be worried about um, Eduard for the, for the purposes of gaming 34. Yeah, so I have also have his minutes closer to what you just described. So let's say something like 84, mm -hmm. 80. And then as you said, uh, for me especially, I have zero utility for these players. Yeah. So I would not look at anything beyond 35, even for someone like him. Yeah. Uh, so 84 and 80, I think, is a reasonable sort of expectation. And the, the other options, which I think people are really wanting to double up on are Eze and Olise. Yeah. And... Eze, I believe, will have most of the minutes secured. I think it's just a question of whether Ulisse starts both games and whether he plays, let's say, 70 to 80 minutes of both those games. What do you have is the realistic uh, expected minutes at? So, for example, uh, we can combine the total of, uh, or have a combined total of the two games. So, would you say about 130 minutes or even lower than that or higher? I mean, it's hard to say. So... I, I think he can play probably 130 minutes. Yeah, I think you're probably just going to see two starts, but two two substitutions that are quite early. So kind of reminiscent of the Liverpool one, because mm. like, do I see him getting benched? Not really. But do I also see him playing crazy minutes? No, because I think, you know, the the Palace team and the Palace staff will be very cognizant of the fact that this will be three starts and three for him. Um, And, you know, he did come off the bench versus Man City. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's helpful in the sense that his minutes have already ticked up quite a fair bit um but yeah i, th I think you the review defaults actually i think are pretty sound on at least maybe they're actually even yeah. a little too high um yeah. but yeah I, I think he's not someone where i think oh yeah we've suddenly got a chance of getting him with 90 minutes and he would have like i don't see a theoretical ceiling that's a lot higher than his defaults on review um on, on, on Olise, whereas with Sarabia, you're going back to him, you know, that comparison, I, I'd say Sarabia definitely does because um, they have similar defaults, but um, I, I would be much higher on Sarabia. And also, uh, you mentioned penalties, I think, yeah. a, a short while ago. Mm -hmm. So with penalties, do you think there is a world where Olise takes one over Eze? I think it's possible. Like, I, I'm sure... I, I don't really think that this Crystal Palace team might necessarily have like a default penalty taker. We've seen Elise take a penalty. I know obviously the last one when Eze was on the pitch was when he technically like literally just got on the pitch. One so it's and very also different. I think the previous ones also are the ones where he won it. So he took it. And 
it's very murky, yeah. right? We have no. And that's the thing too. Like we 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 know yeah. sometimes, even though maybe Eze is the default number one taker, but what happens yeah. if yeah. Olise draws a penalty himself? Like, does he want to take it? And maybe Eze would let him. Like, I I I think you have to sort of leave that that doubt because we don't have certainty over it for now and i think that's fine but i would lean obviously you know as a being like the predominant taker and i'm sh and some people believe it's matera and uh i mean i i can't say that those players would be wrong i just think you just have to be open that um you probably want to be confident about the per the player that you're going for having pen share um and you need to be also cognizant that your player might have an excess pen, pen share right for example like Going back to when we used to discuss Odegaard like mid-season um, mm. and how he had, I think, 30, 40% baked in and then Saka yeah. took like four or five in a row. Like, you know that that EV was a bit dubious, like in hindsight, right? Um, right now, obviously, you're just going to have to make that gut call with Crystal Palace. But, you know, you also have to trust in the minutes too. Someone who's going to play more minutes like Eze or Mateta are probably also going to have uh, better chances of taking that pen anyways. So... Yeah, absolutely. And one, one more point before we move on to the next team is... With Dean Anderson and Munoz, I mm. just think whichever structure you're comfortable with will decide which player you go for. I would yeah. recommend at least one of them. Uh, and also, I would not recommend both of them. Uh, I think that's overkill going for double yeah. Palace defense. And if you were to go for, let's say, double Liverpool defense, because we'll come to Liverpool. Uh, the reason we are podding uh, this late is because we wanted to make sure the Liverpool game was done. And I'm glad we made that decision because, frankly... Uh, we would have said some things that would not have it would not be applicable any longer. So I'm glad we waited for that. Uh, on that note, we can move on to the next team. That's Everton. Yeah. Again, uh, Branthwaite's injury situation is unclear. Uh, so we perhaps might get an update from Sean Dyche before the deadline. The players that most people on free hit are looking for are Pickford in goal. Uh, in and. I don't see any other option on Mikolenko in defense. Uh, that's, I think, the yeah, extent of Yeah, or Tarkovsky, if you want. Yeah. And, or Tarkovsky, exactly. So midfield and def uh, attack is just a no-go. Uh, even though Dominic Calvert-Lewin is on penalties, I suspect he might be benched for one of those games. So it might be better who plays in one and uh, DCL who plays in the other. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of either of those options. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I think obviously, I don't know what's going on with DCL. He might be unfit yeah. again already to start things off with. Um, maybe if we get some sort of confirmation from, from Sean Dyke that he's like completely unfit, then actually Beto becomes a really good pick. But if, let's say, both are available, I think you, you've got no choice but to ignore them. Um, yeah. One of the fixtures is versus Liverpool, even though it's at home for Everton. Um, and even though you, you get to enjoy a Nottingham Forest fixture, like in reality... I mean, I don't know. I'd probably actually prefer a Watkins, and that's very um, it's yeah, it's tough to say that. But in reality, I think it's it's the kind of thinking that you know when you have let's say Solanke, Cunha, Mateta, like I mean, what are you doing here? These these players exactly. have guaranteed minutes. You're you're punting for too much. You're you're basically just looking even, at the goal share. Yeah, and that's it. We haven't even mentioned Darwin, right? So that's yeah, that's no, that's fair. How low Beto should be on your priority list? So. Mikolenko seems like a decent option, but again, you need to, your, your uh, the rest of your draft really needs to be in a situation where you don't have any other option than to go for someone like Mikolenko. Mm. For me, I think it's Pickford or Bust. If, yeah. if I were to go for one player, I think it would be Pickford. Uh, no, I, I, I think you make a good point because, you know, going back to the, the Crystal Palace defender thing, like if I had to make a choice and I was going to go for two defenders, one from Crystal Palace, one from Everton, yes. there, there's absolutely no way you're picking Munio, uh, sorry, Michelenko, um over Munoz or even over Mitchell. Like for me, yeah. I've looked at Mitchell's yeah. underlying stats for like the recent games. And yes, of course, this is, you know, small sample size, but under Glasner, he is playing left mid. He's not left back like when he was playing with Roy Hodgson. So mm -hmm. there is a genuine out of position element to Mitchell's game um with Munoz obviously we see him take a lot of shots now he actually hasn't racked up I guess too much extra in the last few games but you can see that he he has all the the baselines that we want like good XG per 90 actually takes much more shots per game than a Mikolenko for example who I think a lot of people might just fondly remember because he jammed a few clean sheets and goals like within a, a very closeted period in FPL but like when you look yeah. at his underlying stats they're awful for a fullback um, and it's not like he's a, an assistive threat. So 
I think I've, I've had this discussion with Oli, who, you know, is a friend of ours and Everton fan as well. I mean, he prefers Tarkovsky just for the simple point that Everton's play style, I mean, they do play for set pieces as well. And, yeah. um, you know, I mentioned to him too, like, <laughs> I remember owning Pedro Porro for the game when um, I was going to say exactly they, they were game, they were holding the Cario yeah, hostage <laughs> as as a as a set piece strategy and <laughs> and it worked. It so, worked, it worked. Um, yeah, no, f funny thing. But obviously, yeah, I think, um, yeah, Mikolenko is hard to go by. And I agree with you, Pickford's like the only one you want to go with. And McNeil is like a draft pick. So let's just go on yeah, exactly, um, to, exactly. to Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Arsenal is interesting because you, you can either... I mean, right now we have, you know, some doubts over Odegaard and Saka. But in these situations where I think the games are still sort of do or die, you're Ooh. still looking at these Arsenal midfielders as in you'd expect Saka to play, you'd expect Odegaard to play these games are must win and then obviously Havertz who in my opinion fits into both variations of Arsenal starting 11 whether he plays left center mid or striker mm. you know he's a he's also someone who has reasonably high expense right so when you go back to for example the last few games of Havertz I I'm struggling to believe that Havertz would suddenly get benched within the double maybe I'm wrong but um, for the most part of course you're looking at at the bare minimum a, a, a 60 minute substitution which is very very low uh, for habits or you know the usual 90 that we get to see him play where he plays either you know a little bit of left mid a little bit of forward um and and that's nice for habits so the only thing i can say about him though is that he's got slightly higher expected goal involvement per 90 than odegaard so that's the only you know i guess upside of chasing for habits but if you if you think odegaard is fine it's it's so hard to go for habits as a punt um and unless you're like very confident about the central, you know, forward sort of element. Um, and then it kind of is a question about whether you go to Arsenal mid or to Arsenal defense. Like, mm. I, I, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So just wanted to cover all the players. I think there are a lot of players, to be honest, with, yeah. with Arsenal that Plenty. you can go for. So Raya, Gabriel, White, Saliba, uh, Odegaard, Havertz, Saka. Those are your realistic options. Uh, so your point. I think it's a very valid point. I would just, I was just thinking, and maybe this is overthinking by the way, because that's what happens on a free hit, right? When you're not on a free hit, I think you tend to simplify your decisions, yeah. which is most of the times it's fair because Occam's razor wins. But uh, there's some times where I think uh, it's, you overthink a lot. And I think I'm doing that on free hit because all I was seeing against Bayern Munich was, again, I don't care about the performance. I am only looking at text wins. And the Odegaard didn't seem to be fully fit mm -hmm. in that game. So the first thought that comes to my mind is, is Jesus an able deputy for someone like Havertz? And is uh, someone like ESR, Emil Smithro, an able deputy for Odegaard? And can they use that against Wolves? Maybe not in the same game, uh, because uh, that could be too much. But could they split those minutes uh, across the two weeks? And I don't think it's that far-fetched, but also listening to you talk about Arsenal, I think it's right. I, I, it is do or die. And overthinking might just lead to losing EV for no reason. Mm -hmm. Because and, and here's where uh, I'll tell you why I'm th I think I'm overthinking. It's because I even have gone to the uh, eventual or the eventual possibility of losing even someone like Saka, which seems madness. Because if you look at the EV that Saka has for this week, it seems crazy to not have Saka. But the, the, the minutes or, or him limping off after every game, even though I know that some of it is uh, maybe related to performances and some of them is actually, he does get kicked so much. I, I really sympathize with him, but uh, I can't go without him, right? I mean, surely they, you can't go without Saka on a free hit. So it's just a question of, do I want double Arsenal defense? And if I want double Arsenal defense, do I go for Ben White? Because we saw Ben White being substituted after the 60th minute against Aston Villa, which is great for owners. But we've talked about this on, on this part, that that plus six, 60 plus sub can easily go to a 60 minus sub. Because yeah. there's no line in the sand which says, okay, I have to substitute Ben White only after the 60th minute. So I, I, I would still go for maybe Raya and uh, Gabriel uh, in, def in defense. If I were to go, I don't think I will. Just because I want to punt on other players uh, who might have similar EV. I, I don't think you have a problem with playing double defense, right? Because uh, the fixtures are pretty good, I think, for Arsenal. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Another, yeah, yeah I, I guess it comes down to 
Yeah, it comes down back to the midfield, right? Because most of your EV is coming from the midfield first before defense, I suppose. Yeah. So it's like, do you trust in the picks outside of Arsenal and Liverpool? And, um, and, and also, do you trust, trust in Liverpool? Because it does free up a lot of spots. So suddenly, yeah. for example, if you're lower on like a Luis Diaz, an Arsenal midfielder would find their way into your team because in terms of priority mm -hmm. and an EV, like you'd go there first. Um, and that probably means you go for, you know, as you mentioned, something like Munoz plus um, uh, a Liverpool defender plus an Arsenal defender. And, and, and maybe you don't mm -hmm. have that room for, you know, your, your second Arsenal defender. Instead, you go for two Arsenal mid because at least I would say that the Arsenal midfielder uh, minutes are, are much more guaranteed than, let's say, like Luis Diaz's minutes or even arguably Salah's minutes are a little bit dicey, I think, now. I think yeah, we, we, I we've seen early substitutions. He's played poorly. Um, they have five attackers, six even, if you actually include Elliot, because... Let's just switch to Liverpool. I think that's yeah, a good... Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, no, I mean, please continue. Yeah. But yeah, I think, like, right now, you're seeing Elliot as a like for, like, sub, sometimes for someone like, um, you know, Salah. Um, and then, obviously, Darwin can play left wing sometimes. Maybe Gakpo can, of course, sort of drift there, too. Mm. And, and that's a huge problem for going for... A Liverpool player on a free hit. So for me, I I I'd be a little bit cool on just like investing Liverpool attack. If anything, I'd probably maybe want a Liverpool defender, like Robertson mm -hmm. and Van Dijk, um, as a double up more so. And I and and I think because I I know that I can probably get good guaranteed minutes from Arsenal midfielders instead. Like if I it was if I was thinking that it was actually between let's say Liverpool and Arsenal in in, in terms of how I you know construct my squad, I'd probably go there and uh, maybe the the. The player that we're usually so high on in Darwin, I think I'd also be just cooler on him because I think his minutes, you know, they're the, it's 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 very plausible that yes, of course he gets rested today, quote unquote, but like he could he could just get benched one game again, and who knows, like Jota can start a game, Gakpo can start a game again, um, and it's it's something that I think we we should be open to, and if you want to sort of make sure that your your baselines are high. Liverpool defense should cover you more because I think Virgil van Dijk, you know his minutes are safe. Allison, if you want to go there, his minutes yeah. are safe. Robertson, for me, his minutes are safe because Simikas hasn't featured at all. So there must be some like some thought about you know we we just he's not going to do anything for us. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe we see Joe Gomez play because obviously, look in reality, Joe Gomez would be playing left left back. But you know Trent's minutes will also need to be covered somehow. I can't see him playing a hundred and. 80 minutes and even starting three games in a row it's, it sounds like a bit of a reach for trent um but uh so I, I don't know how you feel about really, that it's really weird right so i don't think anyone was expecting all three of the title contenders to be knocked out of europe in the same week that it's was true. yeah almost impossible and almost impossible even so now that that's happened what you said about arsenal i, I should just apply to all three teams Mm -hmm. Which is that they need to keep winning now, and there's nothing else left. And mm -hmm. with respect to fitness, you can take some risks. Now, I don't think you need to take a risk with someone like Trent, who is just coming back from a long-term injury. But I think, for example, playing Robbo for two games yeah. seems pretty reasonable. And because his deputy, let's say even Joe Gomez, who's played pretty well this season at left back. If you were to pick a first 11 for Liverpool, Joe Gomez is not your left back. And there is no reason now to rest players uh, for any teams other than, uh, I'm going to say Man City, just because they have an FA Cup semi-final. But even that, I think they've always used their B team very effectively in, in matches like these and have continued to win them. So, I am very, very uncertain about any Liverpool attackers. You mentioned Salah, and funnily enough, he has been, I mean, I hesitate to use the term bad, but I mean, he has a, hasn't been good, right? Ever since he's come back from injury. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think Salah is the greatest right winger I've seen in the Premier League. So, I'm, I'm not one of those <laughs> who thinks, uh, or who does not <laughs> estimate Salah correctly. Yeah. But I also think there's just something that, I mean, of course, I'm going to captain him just because it would be foolish not to captain him unless Klopp just straight out says, look, I'm going to rest uh, key players in one of those games. That would definitely change my mind. But given the uncertainty in X-Men's, I am likely to go for a double defense. Yeah, I agree. So something like Van Dyke Robertson or Van Dyke and Allison, which would be play, like plain toast going for Van Dyke and Allison. 
but also why why do you want to take risks and i believe you are taking certain risks so for example mateta i th- i think there is some risk you are taking with him which i think is minimal mm. but i would rather spread around the risk in incremental fashion than to just cobble it up into a couple of players where if they drop out you are going to just lose a ton of ev for that player no that's fair um yeah so that covers all the teams and i think we've also talked about how you should think about certain players and and sort of relationships right for example like sarabio lise um yeah. you know your crystal palace fullback versus your everton fullbacks and your arsenal versus liverpool sort of combinations yeah. um yeah. one thing that has been mentioned in the chat i just thought it would be useful to talk in, in this segment is is the question of are there any single game week players worth looking at for the free team I, I mean look our default answer would be no because you know, with, with the appearance point points baked in with a double fixture, I just think you'll you'll not see you know on any sort of optimal quote unquote draft any sort of players um, that have a single gaming fixture. But in reality, um, we can also say that maybe if you let's say are someone who doesn't care about the appearance points so much, and mm. you're just looking at the goal share across the two games versus the one from the singlers, I think you've got Fernandes and you've got Watkins. Um, and I think Haaland would be too risky just because we can't even guarantee 90 right now. But those are the two, only two players I would seriously consider as your free hit picks um, to go against the doublers. And it's not too bad, right? Because Bruno doesn't have crazy ownership. Watkins, has, his ownership has plummeted into you know the sub-10% field. Yeah, exactly. Um, but exactly. he just played 120 minutes as well. So keep that in mind. Um, so yeah, that's the only thought i'd mention before we jump into you know our 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 actual draft segments i don't know if you have any other thoughts in terms of single game week players no i think i think you covered everything yeah um alrighty so in terms of free at drafts we have draft number one this is the review default so you know we do encourage you adjusting your minutes on on review i've i've deliberately just shown the expected value for this game week um, in specific, it, it does you know contain the variation that you're talking about in terms of Munoz and Pickford. Uh, has Robertson, assumedly, because of course it assumes that well, I mean, it assumes that Robertson starts twice, and around that edge of around 72, 75 minutes, he starts to have more expected value than a nailed Van Dijk. Um, mm. Gabriel for the goal threat in the midfield, it has Salah, Saka, Odegaard, Luis Diaz, and Eze. Um, so I, I think very safe minutes with exception to Luis Diaz. And of course, it depends on you know whether we get some news on Odegaard and what you mentioned in terms of you know his fitness and availability. In the forward lines, we've got Solanke and Mateta. Now, I can't really say that there's anything really wrong with this draft with maybe... Honestly, I'd be a little bit low on Luis Diaz. I own Luis Diaz, and I think that it's looking bad, personally, mm. um, for Luis Diaz as a pick for you know, as a free hit pick for Game of 34. Like, if, if I had the chance to revisit it, you know, maybe I, I maybe I wouldn't own Luis Diaz at all. But do I think he starts both games? I, I, I do still think it's possible. Um, we're, we've already seen, however, in the last two games that he's played, that he's been subbed off at 65, 68 minutes. So in reality, I think 75 minutes are a bit of a stretch for Diaz. Um, so, yeah, when you maybe take him out of your team, things would, would suddenly move around. So let's say um, you might actually choose to drop your Munoz um and then go for potentially no, Olise or something else yeah double yeah, liver yeah. double liverpool defense exactly and then in place of that Pickford and get henderson in, in his place so that yeah that could work sets, too sets off a sets off a chain of events that could change your team a lot i i'm, I'm on board with not having luis diaz honestly yeah. i was looking forward to buying him on free hit mm. because he seemed like the only player where yeah. i was thinking okay this guy is definitely going to play both games because he's the only one who is who has good vibes, if I may say so. Yeah, no, I get, I get what you mean. You know, so in terms of his minutes, and now that that's no longer the case, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's eye opening to see an uh, a Luis Diaz owner talk about him in in these terms because mm. normally there's a lot of cope, frankly, and of course everyone is guilty of that. You know, even I'm guilty of that. But if you are realistic and on a free hit, it's a little annoying, by the way, because if he does end up starting both, player uh, people that are not on a free hit don't have any other choice, right? You have to play your double gaming players. Yeah. So it might easily end up that he starts both. So 70 minutes for both fixtures seems reasonable still, I would say. 
given the fact that he is extremely fit and there's still i would say he's up in the hierarchy but jota and uh, darwin both coming off the bench today right if i'm not wrong yeah yeah so that i think just uh, again i'm not going to go into the uncertainty we've already covered that but that just leaves me a bit confused as to what i should go for this draft is you said the the adjusted minutes minutes one or is now nah, this is just the default um we can move on quickly to the adjusted minutes yeah. one let's move to move on to that one because i think this is a more realistic mm-hmm. version of the draft yeah and uh can you uh, take podcast listeners to the draft please. yeah sure so henderson as the goalkeeper um gabriel robertson virgil as your defenders in the midfield positions you've got sala saka odegaard as a sarabia and then in the front line you've got solanke and matera um okay, so, so solanke and matera seem to be yeah, constant yeah across both teams exactly which is which is fair uh, they are fairly nailed on for my team as well and sarabia is perhaps the one spot of contention or maybe odegaard as well so sarabia and odegaard are the two places where i have to decide okay what combination of players i need to go for so right now on my free hit draft i am on brighton ben brighton diaz mm-hmm. and look is it is is he the best pick if you look at his expected value no because his expected value is closer to bruno fernandes than someone like martin odegaard who has a uh, Bruno Fernandes has a single game week, but that's besides the point. One. So yeah. exactly, exactly, it's it's perhaps the best one. But if you look at the the opposition that he's playing, uh, bot both are bottom four for XGC. So uh, I was I made this joke with with uh, other players that are creating in thirty four that they have two great fixtures. They are playing an uber trash defense and they are also playing Burnley. So that's. That's how bad United defense has fallen, and I just think he's going to get so much, so many chances. It's just a case of how many minutes uh, I think he gets. So uh, we also, uh, I think Sheffield United was the one team that we missed out on in in X Men's corner, and we can perhaps cover cover them here. Yeah. So the two options that I'm, or the three options that I was looking at was Gervich in goal, uh, Ollie McBurney as a striker, or Ben Brereton Diaz as a midfielder. Would you realistically go for any of them? Because I somehow think you wouldn't, if if I'm right. Uh, I wouldn't, but that's that's only because, like McBurney, well, in McBurney, you could actually go for McBurney to be honest. Um, on penalties, right? That's the one. Yeah, it's just it's tough to to go for Gerbich, in my opinion, because it's like you're also almost saying that everyone has to lose their clean sheet, which I think is. Hard to say on a week when you have like Liverpool and Arsenal within a double as well, um, and then obviously as you said, like those, you're you're going down to Crystal Palace, Everton next, before you're even touching you know Gerbic right in terms of clean sheet yes. odds. So it's like yes. it is a bit of a stretch to get to there. Um, but yeah, I I think you know BBD makes a lot of sense. I can see a lot of people not wanting to go Sarabia too, because mm-hmm. you know they'll they'll look at the fixtures and. Like, I think, yeah, when you take a fixtures point of view, it's going to be like, well, Wolves have Arsenal, so maybe I take a Wolves player out of my team. Um, and then suddenly you're looking at Sheffield United, where, of course, as you said, they, they are facing good defenses, um, as in to target. And maybe that's the way you, you go about justifying the Sheffield United pick. I do think McBurney actually has really solid EV, though. It's just that his defaults he are does. pretty low. It's just, yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm actually not very clued into Sheffield United, so I can't explain why. I believe he was uh, benched within maybe two weeks ago, um, but otherwise is usually um, an so 18, 19 minute watched, player. I have watched most of Sheffield United's games because yeah. unfortunately we have all the games televised here. And I, I, I would say that uh, whatever situation or whatever the game state is, I've seen that both strikers can get served and that has happened more than I would like. Yeah. So there fair. is a decent probability because they have so many strikers on the base. They have Cameron Archer. They are even Rian Brewster is fit again. So th- I I just struggle to uh, gauge his X minutes. And if I can't gauge his X minutes, I would just rather go for uh, either BBD or no one. Because yeah. Gurbich, you already pointed out, uh, it's even though they are playing good defenses or bad defenses, they are a bad defense themselves. So that's 
going to be hard to justify over someone like Henderson, Pickford, even Allison. Now, my <laughs> my qualms with Allison are something else. It's because of uh, him getting injured when I bought him. Mm-hmm. But of course, I'm not going to consider that on, on a one-week point. So I like this draft much more. Uh, I would say that 9 out of the 11 players on this draft are probably nailed uh, for my team. The real two spots that I'm looking at right now are Sarabia and Odegaard. And perhaps one defender change that I think would clear uh, clarify once I select the two midfielders because of the knock-on effect. So I'm, uh, this is pretty close to what I would go for. That's fair, yeah. Yeah. I think if we were to talk about risk and, and managing it maybe, um, and you wanted to drop you know, some highly owned players... I think those would come from Arsenal, if we're being honest. Like mm. your your Sakas and Gabriels, you could reconsider them. Just because I think with the Gabriel, you could argue that maybe White is close to a like for like. Um, with Saka, at least, maybe you can justify in your head that if you're not going to captain him, um, and you're maybe going to captain Salah, for example, that you can definitely justify getting Saka to your team, going for Odegaard and Havertz instead. Um, but yeah, I think you know, we are getting close to towards the tail end of the season. Some people are going to use this as an opportunity to dial up the risk a bit. Um, and I can understand doing that. Even dropping Solanke would make sense as well if you really wanted to dial up risk. Um, but that's obviously, you know, the choice you make if you want to drop some expected value in exchange for um, completely, you know, cell phone players. So something to mention, of course, um, I think that would sort of bring back your your Cunhas to the to the foreful, forefront. Um, definitely, as I still think is fine. Um, even Mateta and Munoz, obviously. But yeah, you have a lot of options on this free yeah, hit, so which before, is nice. Before we move on, uh, sorry, Pat. Just w- one thing I wanted to mention is, uh, if you, you spoke about risk, right? So one thing that is definitely up for consideration is no opposing play. So if you want to go for a zero jeopardy and just go for a team where no attacker plays no defender, which means that you're trying to maximize variance. Yeah, that is easily possible, and Garbage is funnily enough one of the goalkeepers in in that draft. Because what happens is the way no opposing players pan out, you're left with someone like Garbage. I don't have the full draft with me on hand because I I did run a sensitivity analysis on that, but I was waiting for the Liverpool game to conclude so I could update the X mins, download the data again, and run another uh, uh, sol- solve. So if I can find something interesting, I'll maybe post it on the FPS script uh, Twitter handle. Perfect. But for now, I think uh, this draft should suffice. Yeah. Yep, sounds good. Um, should we move Before on we to... Move on to captaincy, mm-hmm. It's captaincy next, right? Yep. So uh, I think you can maybe talk us through uh, plans for people who only have their bench boost left. So you have to do three transfers, right? So yep. what do you have in mind? Yeah, so obviously the position that my team is in is that I've got two free transfers. But I think for anyone who's been running Souls and Review or anyone who's just been considering their transfers and what sort of strategy they want to go for, you know, ultimately you you take an aggressive approach this week because presumably you still have three to four single gaming players this week or maybe two to three at the bare minimum. Um, and you would like to replace them with, you know, ideally a double gaming player just to get that maximum EV for this week or... You know, you you take a, a patient approach, um, which is something that I'm considering between like, and that patient approach would actually probably lead you towards maybe making transfers that are more uh, Game Week 35 minded, because obviously any transfer that you make on Game Week 35 is, is going to actually have a knock on impact on your Game Week 37 bench boost, because your Newcastle players, for example, will double in Game Week 37, your Chelsea and Tottenham players will also double uh, on Game Week 37 too. So yeah. I, I think some managers have to consider the question that is, you know, if you, let's say, don't have a as a in your team and you're thinking about you know managing your transfers you know the question i suppose is is as a worth maybe something like a minus eight because palmer for example right now you know he's someone who probably has an expected value of you know sub four points as a is close to 10. um the question i suppose is if you make let's say a transfer like as a plus another transfer um, and you get that 12 ev back like that that could be you know the cost of three hits on gaming 35 but if you make these aggressive transfers now, you could recoup that expected value back. Um, it just means that you have to be a bit more hit hungry for um, you know, this week and the next week. Obviously, some managers just definitely don't like the idea of taking hits because hit, hits are absolute. 
you know, that's an EV docking that you can't ignore. At the same okay. time, though, obviously there is, you know, the, the idea of chasing a theoretical ceiling, like as a, for example, can still be optimal for you on, on that edge of 81 minutes, 83 minutes. And if you get as a plane 90 minutes in a row, which I, I actually think is super possible. Like some people are going to look into the Liverpool and the city minutes. And I think they're going to misjudge his minutes because he actually played two games um, at the end of April and at the, sorry, at the beginning of April at, and at the end of March. And I think that the rest was exactly this, uh, your Sunday to March rest. And he still actually played 90 minutes over two fixtures versus worse opponents. And so I think as very capable of hitting 90 minutes. So it goes back to, it goes back to little things like that, where first of all, you also need him to be fit, which is, you know, a little bit of risk added into it. And once again, it comes down to like managerial style as well. I think I've become a little bit more um, passive, but another thing that I'm thinking about too, is just, I want to make sure my bench boost is incredible. So another thing that I've been doing is I've been decaying my transfers with a little bit more aggressive decay. Um, Sorry, not aggressive decay, but much more passive yeah, decay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so that I can actually maybe go for transfers that would set my bench boost up a little bit better. So I'm still in that 50-50 camp. I don't see myself taking these crazy hits for Eze and for Isaac, for example. But I, I still think when you look at my team now, you know, I've, I've got room to maybe do something like Sun to Eze and then um, Muniz to Isaac. And that could work out really well without having mm. to take a hit. And then next week I can take all the hits that I want because I know that those doubles will pay themselves back on 35 and 37. Um, the alternative approach that I've been thinking about simply is just to do something even even more passive, which you don't know my bench or you can't see my bench now, but I have Pau Torres as my team. And he's the only player uh, with my entire FPL team outside of the goalkeepers who basically have no positive impact on any fixtures outside of 34. So he could just simply be a transfer into... Uh, Dan Byrne, and that would be the ultimate passive side side transfer, and the most, um, you know, I completely am, am pretending that Gaming Thirty Four doesn't exist transfer of all time, yeah. Um, yeah. but I might do it. Um, and it also there's the consideration that all of us managers need to think about too, which is you know what's going on with Holland as well. Is it worse yeah. than imagined? Um, so I think one thing to mention too is for all managers, like you just have to make sure that you probably arrive the de to the deadline with um a, 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 a what 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 will you do on the deadline if if Holland is you know rumored to be injured again or to have aggravated his injury um because hmm. it's news to me that Holland is um you know it would be news to me that he's injured i i think you've got 8 days of rest it's very likely he plays versus brighton maybe gets rested versus chelsea instead um yeah, so, I, I think that's how uh, they will play it sorry just an update on that uh, if anyone was waiting for any leaks just to decide, okay, if Holland starts against Chelsea, it means he's perfectly fine. Hmm. The lineups come out an hour after the deadline, yeah. if I am remembering correctly. Yeah. So you have to depend on leaks <laughs> for that. And no one has any incentive to leak the FA Cup semi-final lineup. So it's going to be really hard for you to find a leak for... Uh, although, you know, everyone wants the glory. So if anyone does have the team sheet, I'm sure they'll be uh, zealous enough to share it with everyone. But I just think it's it's a matter of finding the correct source, which I think is going to be very unlikely. But I also think that because the fact that he asked to be subbed and so did Kevin De Bruyne, yeah. I just think they might have been gassed out. And it was a very yeah. intense game. It was a very intense game. If, no, it if was, you didn't yeah. watch it, just watching it um, made me, you know, this, um, <laughs> tired. Yeah, it was honestly. exhausting for me, for sure. It was exhausting. Absolutely. <laughs> for you as a fan, yeah, the emotions. That was tough but, to watch. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I I completely agree with you. So one thing I just wanted to ask you, which is maybe a moot point, but could you have set up bench boost thirty four? Nah, I I don't think so because um, if I set up for bench boost thirty four, I I think the way I see it is that I have to take hits on game week thirty five anyways, which means that that would probably strengthen my bench on thirty seven. Whereas like if I was setting up for bench boost thirty four, it would actually probably make my team a lot more inferior um for 35 and 37 so yeah as i said even even for example like my most optimal transfer for this week that involves let's say going for a double game week or like as a would just be um to, to maybe go for as a and isak which is already basically a 35 transfer isak that is um so yeah if i if i was to make more aggressive sort, sort of 34 related transfers uh no i also think i i, I re-ran the inverted uh 
well, the, the chip, chip, chip strategy yeah, chip planner. planner. And, I, and I think yeah. game week 35 actually showed up as a very good bench this week for me. Because, of course, like, after this week, you presumably have I a very score. strong team because your, yes. your, your Spurs players are coming back to your team if you have them. Yes. And then, obviously, in my keeper situation, I can just take hits for keepers because on a double game week, taking hits for goalkeepers is always borderline optimal. So it, it would kind of work mm. out nicely with the bench boost. But no... Um, I think it's, yeah, I'm still sticking with Game Week 37 Bench Boost. It's nice to see that City are doing well in the league. Um, I still think that because they're out of the Champions League, though, like, they're probably going to go full strength to the end of the season. So hopefully no impacts on my Game Week 37 sort of Man City-related assets. But, yeah, something to think about in terms of, you know, whether I go Foden or Ederson down the line, for sure. Yeah, I think Ederson might just become the best defensive option i mean i think still i still think guardiol is the best defensive option because frankly i don't see him being benched mm. now that they don't have anything else to play for the only th- th- thing that could happen is a potential nickel or something like that yeah i'd like to see him get rested versus chelsea if i'm honest exactly because he's exactly. been he's That's been run I'm... to the ground like you, you could yes. he was one of those players where he was limping two minutes to go for sure um and i was he like was. Yeah. this is not so good but then also you got eight days of rest now so he and he and Modric play for the same national team, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw a moment where um, Modric got tackled. And yeah, and he picked Modric. Modric up. Was like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And normally you don't do that. That's, like... that's your captain there speaking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I I love that. That was a good moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so captaincy. Yeah, we can go to the captaincy. Yeah, that's the last segment as usual, and we have three options. And frankly, I think Salah. Saka and Eze should cover the extent of your risk appetite. Uh, so, like, I would just throw in for good measure, but uh, and Odegaard as well, obviously, yeah. because if you think Odegaard plays 90 minutes in both games, he is a better option than even someone like Eze. Yeah, but I agree. The only reason we don't have him is because uh, the slight uncertainty. I would just prefer someone like Eze who uh, is nearly guaranteed to play to 85 plus. Uh, minutes game. Yeah, and so, I think you, if you yeah. take like let's say your like grass narratives to the table and you want to go Arsenal, like it, it's hard to believe that Odegaard's gonna have vastly better minutes than Saka. So it's like you know you'd be bypassing Saka, which is like the the whole for example, you know when people go for Trent captaincies over Salah and things like that. Mm. Um, it, it's very hard to to sort of justify that. Whereas obviously if you're yeah. like anti Arsenal yeah. for whatever reason because you think they're leggy, okay. like you're more likely to move into Eze. And I think his minutes are still very, very good. And his EV is good too. And and you mentioned Solanke. He's the safest one in terms of minutes, if we have to be honest. Um, Although he was limping as well for yeah. the second half of no, the game. No, it's true. That's true. But I think he, yeah. he's one of those players where, just like Saka, he's going to carry an injury towards the end of the season. 100%. For all we know, Haaland is still carrying that injury. And all these players will have to play in Europe yes. with exception to Haaland because yes. he's going to get some rest yes. in the championships. Um, yep. <laughs> and Saka <laughs> might turn up to next season <laughs> still limping. So you never yeah. know. So, and I think also Newcastle away has to be one of the juiciest fixtures for targeting a defense. Mm. And, and then, now and that then, we are close Ham. to... Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and when you're close to like 19 games, I think that is enough of a sample size now to conclude that the, the defense away from home is just not good enough for Newcastle. So I, I have half a mind to Captain Eze, but I just think Salah's EV is too good. Can I ask you and a question, again, actually, in terms... Because you've yeah. looked into home and away within, you know, all the domestic top flight leagues uh, yeah. in Europe. And, like, so so people like to, you know, share their arguments about, you know, this team is really good away, this team is really good at home. Obviously, we, we just naturally think that teams are better at home and worse away. Mm. Um, but, like, do you, do you take like would, would, would it be prudent at all to take into account how like let's say drastically bad Newcastle are away versus at home like do you think there's an element where even within teams you can say that you can take a little bit of reliance on on their specific performance or do you just have to sort of think that that's that's like a grassy narrative so uh, see I, uh, here's the problem so the grassy part is uh, the predictive nature, mm. which I still think is uh, fairly obscure. Yeah. H- how predictive uh, being bad away from home is for the next away game. I think that when we did not have fans for the two COVID seasons or one and a half season where fans were not allowed, 
the difference between away and home uh, xg drastically went down so usually we see a a 12% uh, delta either way so if you were to consider one as the mean or, or the mean so you would say that a team is 0.88 times whatever their strength is away from home and 1.12 times their strength at home that is the, the sort of ratio that we consider as modelers like myself or kiwi or i don't know if you might have even more sophisticated ways uh, when i saw the whole how how much xgc per night or xg per night sala has when it rains i just decided that this is something else uh, the, the data that the review collects is beyond my understanding yeah. so i'm not going to i'm not going to pretend that review does the same thing i do but uh, i would say that amateur modelers like myself or kiwi we use these numbers the predictive part is what always bugs me is if i can say with how with how much certainty could i say that this event is likely to happen and that is still up for debate mm-hmm. although with 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 more games like for example uh, if you consider no change in coaching staff if you consider no change in personnel i think that that then starts to take shape in terms of its predictive nature like for example newcastle i think is a classic case right they have lost most of their defenders now uh, their back four is sort of makeshift i would say compared to what they wanted to be uh, so how much weight is do you place on that or the personnel that are missing against eddie how being the coach across those 19 games uh, i'm only talking about away games so across those 19 games so it's really a really good question and i wish i had a better answer for you but uh, apart from using those numbers that i just spoke of i don't have any other way of of uh, predicting that no i appreciate that i think like it's it's always interesting cuz I, I think there are some concepts that you know, we have narratives over and, and, and they do bear out very close to reality. And so just worth discussing, like in yeah, the context absolutely. of Newcastle. Um, Brilliant question. So yeah. uh, do we want to take questions before we sign off? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Sure. So Harry Simpson says, would you sell Estupinian and get Olise to keep value in Poro or just sell Poro to access as a wildcard 35? So I think sell Estupinian and think get Olise. Well, I think Poro's due to fall in price, so have a look into whether that impacts your TV, because that's going to be what, one uh, of the elements. What's the diagnosis on Poro, by the way? I just I don't know actually. TV, so I, I, I think it, it might be worth selling Poro just in general because exactly how much exactly. is TV going to hurt you when I think Poro might be the stronger transfer because Eze is so much better of a pick than Olise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would definitely sell Poro. I agree with you. Uh, Omar M says hi. So hi. Uh, Vikran Sharma says, would you punt on Darwin considering he was a late sub today? <laughs> um, I have no opinion on it. I think you have to look into it. Like Darwin started the previous match. Liverpool were definitely trying to win today, and he wasn't in the starting team. Am I saying Darwin's going to get benched next two? Not at all. Um, but does it mean he's guaranteed to start the next two? I don't think that that's that's true at all. So. Mm. Um, reality is he probably could be looking at one, you know, one start out of two, just like, for example, if you're to look at the context of the last two fixtures for Liverpool. Um, but is, is he worth it sometimes with, with that sort of reduced minutes? Because we're still seeing early substitutions for Liverpool. So something like maybe like 28 plus maybe 70. Is that good enough? Honestly, I would say no. Um, so yeah, I have that's my thought on Darwin. Plus, I have him at 80 plus 20 right now. So mm-hmm. fairly close to what you just mentioned. Yeah. And he is not showing up in any of the songs when I use those values. Yeah. And, and I think that's unfortunately fair and, and, and should be how we look at it. Yeah. I, I think those are the only questions. I know that we we are streaming pretty late. So. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah. I got some rest, guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I appreciate anyone who has hung around till now to watch us. Uh, Omar M says, do you think going for Robertson is better than going for Trent on the double? Yes. Short yeah, time. I think yeah. so. Because I, I think, yes, of course, Trent is just, you know, in isolation, a better player. But and, and, you know, due to the Bradley injury, like he could play more. But, you know, he's still going to have reduced minutes because Liverpool are going to manage him. Like when you're watching him play versus Atalanta, today, he was playing great. But there's a reason why he was subbed off. And there's going to be reasons why he'll be subbed off the next two games or maybe not even starting one of the next two. And you can't confirm that. With Robertson, I think at least you can say he's fit, bare minimum. So he's match fit, um, you know, got rested, quote unquote, for like, I don't know, 12 minutes today. Um, not good enough, obviously, but 
I'd be a bit more confident about Robertson because I think like theoretically the ceiling could be higher and and mm. and and maybe also the the floor is also a little bit higher too so yeah um, yeah those are my thoughts fully agree with you yeah so i think we can close it out here uh, once again appreciate anyone who's listened to us live and anyone who will listen to us later uh, tomorrow or the day after uh, yeah. if you if you are not subscribed please subscribe to the channel and help us get to 1k maybe we are around 600 so that would be great <laughs> Yes please. But, uh, yeah, so like and subscribe and uh, hopefully this was a useful discussion. Uh, time stamps will be up uh, shortly and you can maybe peruse through whichever section you find useful. Perfect. Thanks a lot guys. I'll see you guys soon. See you. Bye.